open our Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. I know it looks like we're going to get finished pretty soon, but in reality, we're not going to finish Philippians till next year. <laughs> After this week, our Sunday evenings are going to be changed, and we'll be looking at Christmas a lot. So this will be our last message this year concerning the book of Philippians. And I can't think of a better better way of, of closing out a year but than talking about Paul's exhortation of peace. God's house ought to be a place of peace. God's house ought to be a place where our hearts are encouraged and our lives are strengthened. People for ages have been looking for joy and for happiness and peace. But sincerely, they've been looking in the wrong directions. You're not going to find joy and peace in your television. You're not going to find it on your mobile device. You're not going to find it on the Internet. Very rarely, I think, that people find that peace. I think God has a special place in his heart for the church. And I think a lot of times people think that this would be the last place we could find the answers of life which were the, in which they're struggling. But I believe God has a message for everybody, and I believe every time we come together, every time we open the Bible, every time we, we come to study His Word, I believe there is an individual that God has given this opportunity, whether they're here tonight or not. The apostle here in Philippians 4 begins to exhort the people at Philippi to secure peace within their congregation and encourage them to share it with others. Isn't it sad when peace cannot be found in the church? Isn't it tragic? Sometimes conflict can, can creep up within the church, much like we're going to see tonight in verse 2. Something happens at the church of Philippi, something between two women, and suddenly the whole church is in turmoil. You say, it must have been something horrible. It must have been something about the doctrines. And folks, it could be just as simple as we don't like the color of the carpet. One of my favorite cartoons ever. I used to read all the periodicals that came out was the one where the pastor was laying on the operating table He's got a sheet pulled up to his neck. Next to him is the doctor with the scalpel. On the other side of him is the, is the anesthesiologist with the mask getting ready to put on his face. And at the end of the table there are two little old ladies with carpet swats, swatches. <laughs> pastor, we just can't figure out which one we want. And this pastor's eyes are bulging. <laughs> Please. Please do not bother me with carpet swats in. That's my greatest fear when I'm on the operating table, okay? Sometimes conflicts are caused over the silliest things. You know, we think, it was okay. well, if it's something major, well, yeah, let's take care of it. But, you know, sometimes we allow things to fester in our heart over the silliest things. Paul, in these next few verses of Scripture, begins to explain how they can once more gain peace that they've been searching for. Once more have peace within the church. So let's start with verse 1 in chapter 4. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Eodia and I implore Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known, make, made known to God, and the peace of God, which surround, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. We see Paul's concern for the Philippian church here in verses 1 through 3. Paul's call for dedication is simple in verse 1. We see his genuine love for them. Paul loved the churches of Asia Minor. Paul did many things in his missionary journey, but it seemed that there in Asia Minor, he not only shed tears and sweat, but he also shed blood. Paul was chased out of town on many occasions. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was imprisoned. At Philippi, they literally, when he went into Greece area, they literally put him in jail. Now, what a resume that would be for a pastor, huh? You get a new pastor coming in, well, what's his resume? Well, he's been put in jail several times. <laughs> we see his genuine love for them. Paul literally put his life on the line for people he loved. And we see his godly longing for them. Do you see that very neat? You know, one of the problems people have said, well, how come people don't go to church anymore? There's no longing for one another. It's absent. You know, the Bible says that in the last days, the love of many will wax cold. And I think that's one of the issues because, you know, the Bible here says, Paul says, I long. Look at verse 1 again. He says, my beloved and my longed-for brethren... Well, you know, there's a lot of people that have a longing and, a, as they would say, down south, a hankering for someone or something. But the bottom line is the, what we're seeing in our world today is that there is not a longing anymore for the church. And I don't know how to fight that, and I don't know how to correct that, and, and all I know to do is preach the word, and that's, that's all I have done, that's all I can do. And, you know, because you can't, it's like the old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, Paul here calls for dedication, his devotion to the church. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren. 1 John 3, 14 says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Oh, beloved, we have lost our first love, as John writes, or Jesus writes the church there at Ephesus. We've lost it. We've become entertained. We've become enlightened in all the things that would thrill our, our brain, our mind, our heart, but our soul is sick and weak, and we don't know why. Philippians 1.8 says, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Paul said earlier, I long with you with the affection, the love of Christ. Now I agree with you, not all of you are lovable. I see that you're agreeing with me too. Now, I'm not saying that, that you're not worthy of love. I'm just saying sometimes you and I are just not lovable, you know? And I understand that. And, you know, sometimes we walk into church and, and uh, it looks like we are in trouble. And so what you need to do in a case like that is either run to the other side of the church. No. <laughs> but you pray for that person. Paul says here, I have a delight in the church. You know, there are people who had problems there. We're going to see this in verse 2 in just a moment. But there were people who had problems. Paul says, look, I, I delight in the church. You're my joy and my crown. He remembered them in rejoicing. You know, Paul led many of them to the Lord. He rejoiced with them in the joy of their salvation. Oh, I, I've seen people whose lives were wrecked and ruined by sin and gone into those old homes and stood there and told them about Jesus and they got saved and their whole life was changed. i never forget the man that I went downtown in Jacksonville, literally downtown. 
the carpet was moving when I walked into that apartment building and it was the cockroaches all over the place. And I smelled the smell of goulash cooking as I went into his, knocked on the door of his room. He had a little heating pad. He was a truck driver. He had a little heating pad. Had a little skillet with goulash. Man, it smelled good. And I walked in there, just a one room, little place he rented. There he had his bed and his little suitcase on the bed getting ready to leave in the, in the next few days, he said. But I told him, I said, I've got to tell you something. He says, what's that? I said, I've been sent here by the government of England to tell you that Queen Elizabeth has said you have a mansion ready for you. And they want you to come and take care of it. Boy, his eyes looked at me. looked at me. Well, who is this crazy man coming into my room telling me that? And I told him, so, well, I hate to tell you this, but that's not true, but I do have something to tell you. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, he said, I've got a mansion for you in heaven. I ended up leading him to the Lord. It was a sweet time. And he came that Wednesday night. That was a Tuesday night. He came that Wednesday night because he was a trucker. He was going to go out the next day. He came forward, made a public profession. We baptized him that night. It was one of the sweetest times I've ever led anybody to the Lord. I don't know what happened to him afterwards. I'll never meet him again until we get to heaven. But you know, sometimes you have a special delight in your heart for those you've led to the Lord. You see, Paul remembered them in rejoicing. You're my joy, you're my crown. He regarded them as his reward. What is the economy of heaven, folks, but people? We go to a place where they're going to make the streets, where they've made the streets with gold. Can you imagine the poor bankers when they go there? They're going to, they're going to be scraping up pavement for the, probably the first few years in heaven. And the Peter's going to shake his head and say, well, they're, they're picking up asphalt here. What are they doing? Gold is not the economy here. The economy of heaven is people. So I've got to ask you a question. What's your bank account look like? What's your bank book look like? Have you gone? Have you have you sent some over there? There are some people over there right now that I know that are waiting to see me rejoicing. I'm looking forward one day going over there and seeing them. I don't know if I want to go tomorrow. I've got my ticket. I just don't want to get punched yet. I led a couple people to the Lord in a funeral I had last Friday. Folks, there's still people that need Jesus. Paul remembered them in great rejoicing. You are my joy and you are my crown. Paul had led them to the Lord. They literally were his joy and his crown. And then we see Paul's directive to the church in verse 1. He says, I want you to stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Somebody's going to always be there to try to knock you down. Always. I've never known a time in my Christian work that there wasn't someone, somewhere, somehow, that's not going to say, you know, you're not really doing anything for the Lord. Sometimes they're lost people. Sometimes they're Christians. Sometimes they're friends. Sometimes they're family. But we know that we have an opportunity to stand fast. His instructions was for fidelity. Be faithful. Be faithful, always faithful. That was Paul's important message to the church of Philippi. You see, God is highly pleased with your faithfulness. You know, a lot of times we seek to be, succeed for God. We think it's important as American citizens many times, we've got to be first and we've got to succeed and we've got to do... Folks, sometimes God says, I'm not going to to be impressed with your success as much as I'm going to be impressed with your faithfulness. 
stand fast. We see his identification of their faith. He says, stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Aren't you glad he didn't say stand fast in me? I am. I'm not here to teach you or to tell anyone that they ought to stand fast in me. Rather to stand fast in the Lord. We see Paul's call for dedication. And that's my call for you tonight and for me. To be dedicated for the things of God. Not just going through the motions, not just doing here and doing that and doing a few things for the Lord, but to be dedicated wholeheartedly to the things of God. Look at verse 2 and 3, Paul's concern for their division. I implore Iodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Paul says in verse 3, And I urge you also, true companion, Help these women who labor with me in the gospel. These women were Christians. They, they worked there. They, they were hardworking women, literally leading people to Jesus. With Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He's talking about Christians here. Be careful, beloved. The devil can use Christians just as much as he can use lost people. We see in verse 2, the apostles' perception of their issue. He recognizes the personalities of discord. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd rather have my name in the Bible for this reason, would you? One day we're going to meet these people. Oh, yeah, I read about you in the Philippians. And they'll say, aren't you glad we're changed? Aren't you glad we're, we're not that way anymore? You see, there are people who literally bring discord in the church as Christians. And then he regards their problem of disunity because of what they're doing. He says, implore them, I implore them to be of the same mind, which means what? They're of different mind. Now, folks, you got to understand how easy that could have been back then. There was no New Testament Bible. They didn't have something as nice as you and I have today that we can carry about with us, that we can open up. Aren't you glad you got a nice Bible? Oh, you know, of all the people of the world, we have been blessed. I've got probably about 100, 150 Bibles in my office. There are times I've taken them out and given them to people or sent them to people because I get, I get convicted sometimes. But you see, I like, I'm like the, the auto mechanic. I like tools. And these are my tools. But beloved, let me say this to you. We must be able to settle the issues of disunity within the church. And how do we do that? Paul recognizes the problem of disunity. The problems that cause disunity in the body Folks, Christian unity is always with the Lord. Do you see that with Paul writing here? To be of the same mind in the Lord. Unity is not you win, I lose. Unity is not I win, you lose. Unity is not we both win and the Lord loses, but the unity is when I or you, both or different times, decide I'm going to do what the Lord wants us to do. You see, not with, these, not with these things, but with the head of Christ. Christ is our head, excuse me, that we can take the disunity and make it unified. We see the apostles' perception of the issue. We see the apostles' plea for intercession in verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion, Help these women who labor with me in the gospel. These women, again, were, were good laborers. They worked hard. They did many things for Jesus. With Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Well, she said my cake was not good. She said I should have put vanilla icing on it and not lemon icing. Now, folks, we chuckle at that. 
But there are church problems that have been caused by things as simple as that. Does it matter? No. People dying and going to hell and we're worried about what kind of icing we're going to put on our cake? Tragic. We see his request for present assistance. He said, look, my fellow companion, my true companion, help me out here. I can't be there right now. I'm in prison. But could you please calm these two women down? And then we see his reminder of previous assistance. He said, these people have always been good. They've labored with me. Folks, listen, the devil can get into anything. Then we see in verses 4 through 6, Paul's criterion for the peace of Christ. Paul says, now here's what I want you to follow. This is what I want you to teach them. There are going to be three basic steps to peace with Christ here. Look at verse 4. First, he says, I want you to manifest praise for the Savior. Look at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. I cannot say that verse without hearing that song over and over in my mind. Rejoice in the Lord a few times. No. Rejoice in the Lord when everything's going right. No. Folks, we need to rejoice in the Lord always. And if you can't rejoice in the Lord, I don't think that's the Lord's problem. I think that's my problem. So rejoice in the Lord always. A daily praise with our lips. You see, our words must match our heart. The reason why people don't praise the Lord on a daily basis is because on a daily basis they're not prepared for it. The devil comes to your door, wakes you up in the morning. He's the first one to meet you at the dinner at the kid, uh, breakfast table. He's the first one to meet you at work. Man, he just messes your whole day up. And your heart's not ready to praise. I don't care how religious you seem to be. I don't care how much you think you do. Folks, listen. The devil can take anyone, including me, and mess your life up for the day. We see our words of worship, singing songs and speaking scripture. You know what I did one time? This was the neatest thing I ever did. It changed my whole driving patterns. One year I decided that I was going to drive into town. It would take me 45 minutes to an hour to go into town. So what I did was I wanted to go through the entire New Testament on tape. Shows you how long ago that was. And so I listened to the whole New Testament. Folks, it's hard to scream and yell at people in the car when you're listening to the scriptures. Hard to shake your fist at somebody, and that's all you should be shaking at somebody when you're listening to the scriptures. Words of worship. Do you pray in your car? I do. Now, I don't close my eyes when I drive, but I do pray. I pray a lot in my car when I'm alone. Do you sing? Oh, yeah. Listen, folks, it's a great thing. Nobody judges you in your car by yourself. The Lord loves to hear his praises sung. Words of wisdom, sincere speech, and saturated scripture. Folks, listen, you need to be saturated by the word of God. The reason why you have a bad day is sometimes you're not prepared for a good one. Folks, you're in a battle. I want you to know that you're going to be in battle tomorrow morning. When you wake up, the devil's going to shake his stick at you and he's going to say, you can't do it. You need to have words of wisdom. Read a little bit about it. it doesn't, you don't have to read 23 chapters tomorrow morning. Just read a couple of verses or a verse itself. Purpose in your life. Say, I'm going to read through the book of Psalms this coming year. And purpose in your life to read maybe a verse at a time. Read through the Psalms. You'll be surprised what that will do for your life. And let that saturating scripture Choose to make your words different, huh? And then there are words of witness, sowing seeds, sharing salvation, 
securing souls. Folks, the, the whole process is simple. Paul said it this way in Corinthians. He said, some of us sow seed, some of us water that seed, and some of us reap. But God gives the increase. Now that's simple, folks. All it is is a matter of laying a Bible on a table. It's as simple as putting a track on the table. It might be as simple as saying to someone, come and see, come to my church. I have a lady at the funeral said, oh, I wish I lived closer to your church. I'd like to be a part of it. I gave him my card and said, come on. If you can't come but just once in a while, I'm thinking it's probably more than you're doing now. Let's go. Come on. Now, folks, listen to me. We have a responsibility. If it's as simple as saying, hey, get on YouTube. Watch us. Now we've got something where they can look at me, and boy, is that scary. Well, I don't like to watch it myself. But you know, beloved, let me say this to you. It's a good way of getting people interested in coming to church. You know what the secret of the preaching of this church is? It's simple. I just go verse by verse by verse. It's not me. It's the Word of God. We see here, beloved, we are to words of witness. Now, let all your words praise God. No gossip will come from the lips of praise. <laughs> Isn't that true? Think of that. No gossip will come from the lips of praise. No angry words will come from the lips of praise. If anybody has a problem with you, you know what we ought to do? Especially in the church. Someone comes to you as a problem rather than answering back or being ugly or or saying something nasty, or just huff off and be in a, in a problem, rather than say, let's, let's pray. Well, wouldn't that change things? Let's pray. Let's pray about this matter. Next we see in verse 5, first there was manifested praise for the Savior. That's how you get, bring peace into the church or into any home or family. Praise. And then we are followed by maintaining poise for the Savior. Look at verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Let your gentleness be known to all men. You see, his daily power is provided for you. You don't have to let your emotions run your life. You don't have to let your circumstances run your life. The Bible says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Now, folks, that's an, that's an uh, ex exhibiting the internal fruit of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Gentleness is one of those fruits. Paul's saying here, let the fruit of the Spirit be evident in your life. You see, that fruit is simple. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's all found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. He's saying here very simply, exhibit the internal fruit of Christ in your life. Rather than react with, oh yeah, well your mama wears combat boots, you know. Rather than look at a person and, and immediately snap back or be ugly or nasty and mean. What an interesting way to, to be gentle and kind. Show joy and peace in your life. You know, it just takes that power of the devil right out of their hand. And then we see it says to all men, you're to exhibit his eternal fruit. And what's his eternal fruit? Bearing witness, winning souls, sowing, watering, reaping that same process. The Bible says do it to all men. Okay, if it's to all men, that's not just to Christians that you just show this gentleness and this love and this peace. You're to show it to all men. And women, we see his power, his daily power is provided. You want peace in your church, beloved? Begin exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. You say, well, I don't have any talents. Well, you don't have to show any talents. You just exhibit the peace of Christ in your life. And every one of us, beloved, 
Every one of us are asked by God, demanded by God, that we show the fruit of the Spirit in our life. Why is it that we would show it everywhere else but not our own church? Everywhere else but not our family, not our friends? Look at his daily presence as provided. The Lord is at hand. He is near in discipleship. Folks, when you come to church and want to learn and you come to Sunday school and you come to discipleship classes and you come to Sunday morning and you come to Sunday night, you're here because you want the word. Imagine me getting up here and telling you the football scores for the day. Wouldn't that be just thrilling? Would you just be excited all over? Wouldn't you just go out the door and say, Oh, goodness, the Patriots won again. I'm so excited. Beloved, let me say, he is near in discipleship. If you would follow the Lord in discipleship, or you would fellowship with the Lord in discipleship, I promise you, you'd be strengthened. And then he is near in death. Psalm 3, Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Folks, the rod and the staff, God never beat his sheep. A rod was not used to beat the sheep. The rod was to use to beat the wolves, to beat the snakes. I don't know about you, but my first encounter with a snake is not, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> Usually I'm jumping up and down. If I got something in my hand, I'm flaying it, right? His rod was used to protect. His staff was used to guide. You see, when you come and you study God's word, that word is like a great rod. It reaches out and smashes the head of the devil. And that crook on that that uh, cane, that, that uh, staff, thank you. <laughs> My brain just went, whoop, and it went out the door. The staff that the shepherd used, he had a crook on it, and he would bring the sheep back into the fold. He would guide them. And when we study the word of God, we have within us a powerful force to use against the things of this world. You know, I tell you what the problem of the church is today. There's too much of the world in the church. Too much. And then we see he is near in deliverance, the rapture. Folks, I can just feel, almost feel the soon coming of Jesus. He says in Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And then verse 6, finally, the magnified prayer to the Savior. Paul says if we want to have peace in the church, we need to manifest praise for the Savior. And then we need to maintain our poise for the Savior. And then we need to finally magnify prayer to the Savior. Look at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Oh, isn't that good news? But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We see prayers of adoration. Praise his greatness, his person. You say, well, I don't know him. Well, you know, folks, you don't have to know God personally. You can read about him. You can I, Listen, I love reading biographies. Now, you know, I love reading the Bible, and I love reading Christian books, and I do a lot of reading. Trust me, I do a lot of reading. And I love to read the things of God, but sometimes I'll go off and I'll read a, a biography of someone. And it's exciting to me to see how life deals with other people and see how it all works about. You know, sometimes it's kind of, I guess, misery loves company. It's good to see that they go through tough times too. But we see here, folks, we need to praise his greatness. And the only way you're going to know about God is read his word. And then we see praise his grace, his provision. Oh, folks, you ought to be thankful every day that God gave you grace. Think of that. He didn't have to do that. His grace meant that he loved you. His grace meant that he forgave you. His grace meant that every sin you ever committed before you were saved was forgiven. Every sin that you were to sin after you were saved was forgiven. 
What a provision he gave. And then we praise his glory, which is his power. Folks, there's no one. Many times I pray to the Lord as I am praying, I said, you know, Lord, you are holy and I'm sinful. Oh, Lord, you, you are magnificent. I am nothing. Oh, Lord, you, you are holy. And I, I am a sinner to be saved. Oh, Lord, you are powerful. And I'm weak. There are times, beloved, we need not to butter God up, but we need to come in our own heart, recognize who He is in our life. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Can you imagine the creator of the world wants to have a personal relationship with you? And then there are praise not only of adoration, but praise, prayers of appeal. Supplication for others. Folks, you ought to be intercessors. By this time in your Christian life, you ought to be intercessors. You ought to have people you're praying for. I pray for you. I pray for other people. I have certainly pray for my family. I pray for my wife. I pray for you. I pray for many people. I know I have friends I pray for. There are times when I'm going down the road or sometimes I'll be walking in the mall. Sometimes the Lord will say, pray for that person. Lord, I don't know what to pray. What do I pray for? Just pray for them. And I do. Folks, you ought to purposely in your heart, if you want to have peace in your heart, you ought to be a prayer warrior, an intercessor in the lives of others. Purpose today to say, I'm going to be that kind of person. And then there's supplication for ourselves. Confession. Lord, I, 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 am, I need your work. I need your help. And then there's supplication for ourselves in the matter of need. Oh, listen, if you got children, you better be a prayer intercessor. <laughs> if you have children, you better be a prayer intercessor. I watched my mother pray for me every day. At first, it got kind of to me. Can't you find somebody else to pray for? Am I that bad you got to pray for me every day? Mom, I'm not doing anything. And give me all these verses to read and stuff. Mom, what is wrong with you? But then later on, I found out how important that really was. When I became a parent, I, I realized how important that was. I pray for every one of my children every day, all day long. Man, there are times I pray for them more than once, more than twice, more than three or four times. There are times the Lord brings you up to my heart many times too. <laughs> Prayers of appeal bring peace into your heart. Prayers of appreciation. We ought to be thankful for the things of God. Do you see that in verse 6? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Here it comes with thanksgiving. Oh Lord, when are you going to bless me? Back in the 60s, there were that beautiful song, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make a mint. I work hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Oh, listen, how many prayers have we prayed and God says, Really? That's what you want? That's the joy of your life. We see we ought to have abundant thanksgiving in the things of God. And, you know, there's an acquired thanksgiving, too. You know, thanksgiving's not natural. It's not normal. We taught our children from little bitty things from the table. Before they left, they had to say thank you. And they had to go around the table, give me a kiss and give mom a kiss before they left. We wouldn't let them go from the table without being thankful. And we pass that on, and that happens with our grandchildren too. And there's a reason why we do that. Not because we're, you know, silly or arrogant or what, what somebody to do that, but we're teaching them to be thankful. It's an acquired taste. We're not normally thankful people. 
Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter in his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Look at verse 7. We'll close with this. And the peace of God which surrounds all understa- surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Folks, you need to guard your heart and mind. And how do we do that? We do that with a peace of God which surpasses all understanding. That's why a lot of us are in trouble. That's why we don't know what to do. That's why we struggle. That's why we have problems, because our hearts are not guarded by his peace. We see the godliness of his peace in here. If you want the peace of God, note two things. The personal peace of God, it was his divine nature. Nobody in this world is going to give you peace. No one. And the profound peace of God is that it is incomprehensible. It's not based on your circumstances. You see, a lot of people think, if everything would just be going great, I'd be happy. And see, we we confuse happy with joy, or we confuse happy with peace. Paul's, Paul's writing this letter from prison, for goodness sake. Paul is saying here in verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ. It is through praise, through peace that we know his joy. And then we see the guardianship of his peace. Peace does not come through our circumstances, but through the presence of God in our life. The guardianship of his peace, it will guard your heads, your thought life, Sometimes we're anxious. Sometimes we're because we think too much. We think we dwell too much on the evil in this world. We dwell too much on what could happen or what will happen. Folks, your head sometimes can play games with you. And so it is the peace of God that will guard our heads, our thoughts. The peace of God will guard our hearts, our decision making. And the peace of God will guard our hands, the things we do. Sin robs us of our peace with God. God's peace guards us and it guides us that we might say no to sin. Before we say that, God's already speaking to your heart. His Holy Spirit's already speaking to your heart and we ought to say no. But you see, as Paul says here in verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Didn't say could, possibly, but it will guard. And the reason why we don't have the peace is because we won't let God guard it. Churches need peace. And there are too many churches that are, are being, being riled up over the silliest, goofiest things. Paul says, you know, I'm glad he didn't name what these two ladies were having trouble with, aren't you? Because she was, well, I don't do that. I don't have that problem. But you see, it can be any problem we have in the church, whether it be if we're going to have this donut or that donut, if we're going to have this kind of coffee or that kind of coffee or our curtain. We need curtains in this room. You know, I've had people say the stupidest things. I remember a trustee one time in another church. Another church and he said, as long as I am trustee, we'll never have carpet in the auditorium. What a tragedy. What a, s- almost said stupid, but I won't. Sometimes we do the dumbest things in the name of Jesus, do we not? And is it any wonder we have no peace? Paul says there's always going to be this. You need to fight it. You need to work hard. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And let the devil take another walk to some other place. Let's pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. 
Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Let's be the time.